back everyone. Um, so this panel is called Outside the Opera House in the Gallery. Our first speaker is Minu Arjumand. Um, Minu is an assistant professor in English at the University of Texas, Austin. Her first book, Staged, Show Files, Political Theater and the Aesthetics of Judgment, is coming out this fall with Columbia University Press. And the title of her talk today is Radio Opera. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for inviting me and to, to Kay and Armin and David and Heather and everyone for organizing this fantastic conference, um, which I'm selfishly so excited for because I'm beginning a new project and this is very much a work in progress and I'm looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts and ideas about it. Um, okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is a series of commissions that were done in um, conjunction with Documenta 14 last year. So I'm first going to just describe some of what that was and some of the uh, pieces created for it. And then the second half of the presentation, I'm going to transition into thinking maybe in a little bit more of an abstract way about what the formal elements of these new opera commissions might indicate about the politics of experimental opera today. Um, okay, so as many of you already know, Documenta is a contemporary art show that takes place every five years in um, in the city of Kassel in central Germany. I think the, the film that we're going to see tonight was actually presented at the same uh, documenta. So the most recent iteration, which took place this past summer, um, also featured a second large site in Athens. Um, and the decision to have those multiple spaces was linked to a thematic focus on austerity politics and especially on the refugee crisis. And I think what we see generally in the art world is a real interest in sort of different sorts of participatory art projects and thinking about how art can reflect or instantiate or be democratic. One of the, oops, one of the elements of this much larger show was also a um, a series of radio programs. Um, so this was in addition to the physical exhibition spaces in Castle and Document and Athens, Documenta 14 and Deutschland Funk Kultur collaborated on the series of um, what they called public radio broadcasts and events called Every Time I Hear the Sound, which is a name Every Time I Hear the Sound, um, but written phonetically, a name taken by from the uh, Jamaican and dub poet Mubaraka. And these broadcasts included 32 newly commissioned works, as well as the creation of a pop-up radio station in Berlin um, that was called Savvy Funk, and that broadcast <laughs> live out of the Savvy Contemporary Art Gallery. Um, the, uh, the commissions were also broadcast live um, around the world on different FM stations. So here in the States, it was Pacifica, but it was, um, as you can see, many different stations around the world. And according to the, uh, oh, and so you could either, you could either go online and listen to one of the broadcasts online. So you could say, I want to listen to the Indonesian broadcast with the, or the Brazilian broadcast, um, or and that you could do through the website like this, or you could listen to the particular commissions through the same website. So according to the organizers, around 700,000 people uh, stream broadcasts or content online um, through the website. And that's just, that's also in addition to the live visitors at the Savvy Funk radio station. So this is what the, uh, the um, Savvy, savvy Contemporary Art Gallery looked like, and they built this uh, studio right in the middle of it. Um, and in addition to the studio, they had live performances. You can kind of see out there some space for that. There was a 
library. There was a very cool cafe with a bunch of records. Um, and then there were some interesting miscellaneous sorts of art objects, like this guy on the corner there. Um, okay, so a little bit about the works themselves. Um, they were quite wide-ranging, and interestingly, they many of them called themselves very different things, ranging from a sound essay to opera. Um, many of them were created through collages of archival or historical recordings and found materials. And of the 32 commissions, there were two that specifically called themselves opera. Um, so the first one is by Post Commodity, which is an indigenous interdisciplinary arts collective based um, in New Mexico. And so this is just the, the schedule of their work, um, The Ears Between the World Are Listening, which they termed a two-channel hyperdirectional four-act opera. So the idea of this opera is that the, um, the opera itself is uh, sent out over speakers, is broadcast on speakers around the site of the ancient Lyceum. So the idea is that it creates, it has all of these stories about migration, um, songs about exile from the American Southwest, from Syria. Uh, and in broadcasting this, um, as you can see, quite, quite lengthy, uh, opera um, in the space, what they were trying to do is to make a connection between the uh, Aristotle's peripatetic philosophy, the idea of walking in the Lyceum, and the walking of migrants. So I am, hopefully this will work, I am going to play a short video clip that they created, and I'm afraid the volume might be low, so I'll stop talking and see what we can do. Now I'm now I'm having all of these thoughts about that and spatiality that maybe we'll, we'll come back to uh, afterwards. The um, the second commission that called itself an opera was um, termed itself a radio opera, and this I'll play a clip from. It's a montage of um, many different sorts of classical texts of early radio and about early radio. <coughs> So you'll have to take my word for it that that's uh, that that's what it's about, and um, it's pretty 
it's pretty cool. It begins with uh, some different sorts of sound recordings, some electronic type music, but then also uh, the text of some Marinazzi manifestos. So that's that's what you should be hearing in the background. Um, Oh, there it is, a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in these two works and their designation as opera in particular, but I'm also interested in thinking about this whole project as an operatic sort of project. All of the commissions, the physical space that you go into, and I think we'll hear more about the installation opera. Um, and in particular today, what I want to think about is how this radio opera sees itself or tries to be or might be um, political. So the documenta this year uh, was really, and also received some criticism for the PR that really stressed its politics and it being political. I like this ad because it kind of it reminds me of like I don't know an ad for McDonald's or something like now with more beef. It's documentary now with more politics, <laughs> um, and so there there was a fair amount of criticism of this, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. from the right, but also from the left of turning austerity politics and the refugee crisis into a sort of boon for the art industry. And this was one of the big public sculptures that you saw, which were tubes um, that were outfitted as refugee homes inside. Um, okay, so the rest of the presentation is going to really be about what the politics of this commission, what they, what they were, what they stated they were, and how we might use them to think about the politics of opera. So I'm going to focus on three approaches. The first is thinking about these commissions in terms of the historiographical work that they do. The second is their models for participation, um, political participation, but also audience participation. And finally, ideas of assembly and um, embodied co-presence, and to what extent that's actually, that's a prerequisite for a political theater or a political opera. So the historic, historiographical aim is most apparent in the mission. Um, so this is, I apologize, it's a long, it's a long statement, but I'm, it's, it's all good, so I'll read all of it. So uh, the curators write, um, the project, which draws its title from the Baraka's dumb poetry, takes its cue from the privileging of visual culture over auditory knowledge in most Western cultures. Great philosophical thought, in particular, often reduces experience primarily to the visual, building its epistemology of historiography on the act of visual witnessing, apoxia, and considering the act of seeing as the principal source of knowing. In cultures with the so-called oral tradition, histories transmitted through narration freely assume the forms of both identifiable and non-identifiable vocal utterances, speech, sound, and music. Here, sonority is fundamental and functions outside of visual and written logic, goes beyond it, and can neither be grasped nor fully understood through it. When auditory experiences are shared, histories too are shared, and not only from mouth to ear, they are perceived by and encoded in the body through the physicality of sound waves passed on from one generation to another. Okay, so the, the main curator of this, um, of Every Time I Hear the Sound, um, Bonaventure Nidikung, uh, was already the curator of Savvy Contemporary and then designed the pop-up and oversaw all of the commissions. Um, and from the beginning of opening this gallery, he's been interested in breaking, breaking down what he terms the north-south dichotomy, and practicing what he terms decanonization as method. So in an essay called, um, 
called the Globalized Museum, Li Kung calls out the colonial logic of much diversity programming that ignores intersectional identities and will, for example, host an Africa show every 10 years, but then otherwise not include contemporary African artists in, um, in their shows. And in the place of this kind of programming, he calls for a global museum that rejects the North-South dichotomy in art and continually aims to destabilize both old and new canons. He writes, decanonization involves dismantling the hierarchical structures that produce canons and striving to eliminate the emergence of parallel canons. So the idea is not to replace a colonial canon with an anti-colonial canon, but to destabilize canons altogether. Um, and this requires not just uh, not just uh, changing or challenging the canons, but also revealing the structures through which canons are made in the first place. And in a sense, both of, both of the operas here do that in some way. It posts commodity by linking the sorts of the knowledges gained by migrants through migration with the sort of Greek Aristotelian tradition. Um, and Rundfunk Eterna by building a radio opera out of this montage of <coughs> clips from early radio. The best example for this sort of work, though, actually isn't either of those two, but a third commission that wasn't, they didn't call it an opera, they called it a sound essay, which kind of sounds as far from opera as you can get in terms of terminology. Um, but they called it a sound essay called The Gramophone Effect, which <laughs> combines um, British imperial ethnographic recordings with contemporary Indian folk singers and, and Indian sound artists. So let's try to play the clip and see what happens. probably as, as good as we'll get for that, and I apologize about the volume here. Um, okay, so turning now from the from the commissions themselves to thinking about thinking about politics and how these engage politics. And my my immediate impulse, right, was to turn immediately to um, to Brecht and Benjamin and both of their projects for radio and their ideas of radio as a sort of, um, as Benjamin calls it, a training ground, right? Whether through uh, the Brecht Lehrstücke or through the hearing models, her modella, that Benjamin himself wrote, the idea that, and this is from Benjamin, radio's popularity has the ability not only to mobilize knowledge in the direction of the public, 
but mobilize the public in the direction of knowledge. The idea that radio takes the listener, and this is something that Brett and Benjamin share, radio takes the listener as a potential expert, shifting who is doing the training and who is being trained, and in that way developing, and this is Benjamin, though it could be Brett, I think also, the expertise of the listener. Um, but as I thought more about this, it seemed like that didn't actually quite capture what was going on here. That the sort of participation and idea of a public that this, um, that these commissions created was something that was actually quite different. And I think it was quite different than the way that we might usually conceive of political theater in two ways. The first is um, that there's a shift away from the, the importance of co-presence and liveness, right? That you can, you can listen to these clips and these operas in sort of whichever way you want. And the second, which they state explicitly in the mission, is a shift away from visuality. So liveness and visuality are two things that are at the core. I think of opera studies when we think particularly in, in the sort of discourse around Brigitte Theater of what makes opera political, right? We, we might say, oh, this, this version of The Flying Dutchman is more politically radical than this version in terms of the score. But usually we're talking about the, the design that we see on stage, at least to a great extent. And of course, in <coughs> political philosophy, the metaphor of the visual of the world stage as the sight of the public absolutely dominates. So whether we think about Habermas's theory of the public sphere or Arendt and Ranciere's conceptions of uh, the public as a space of appearances, the visual is central and also the idea of assembly is absolutely central. And not coincidentally, of course, all of these theories are referring back to Greek tragedy and the Greek polis as sort of the moment of politics, but it's also a very sort of local moment and space of politics. So what these projects make me think about is what sort of public and what sort of uh, participation requires neither appearance nor embodied co-presence. Um, can we think of another form of politics that is a diasporic or a global sort of politics that doesn't rely on physical co-presence and that imagines the possibility that publics are constituted orally? Um, and this led me to a theorist who I think is not is not probably the first person, like, at least for me, Brecht is the first person who we think of when we think of opera studies, um, but is absolutely central to this whole project, and that's um, Frantz Fanon and his writings on radio. So in his essay, This is the Voice of Algeria, Fanon charts the way that radio becomes central to the anti-colonial um, struggle to the to the war in Algeria. And so he writes about the ways that initially, up until 1954, um, radio sets were really only purchased by colonists, by French people in Algeria, and the programming was also particularly targeted towards um, Frenchmen. And there's a shift that takes place first in 1954 with the founding of the FLN, but then, particularly in 1956, when um, an unauthorized radio station begins to broadcast news of the resistance. And this radio station was called the Voice of Free Algeria. It would disseminate its schedules through pamphlets. Um, Fennel uses theatrical metaphors in this essay to talk about the way that radio created national unity by bringing together the fragments and splinters of acts gleaned from correspondence in different areas and fit these scattered acts into a vast epic. What's really interesting in Fennel, though, is that it's not about creating a discursive community, right? And so this is where there's something 
fundamentally different happening than in, say, ben Benedict Anderson's ideas about print culture and nationalism. So what happens is that the French realize what's going on, and they start to set up their own broadcasts in order to jam the frequencies that uh, Radio Free Algeria, the voice of Free Algeria, is broadcasting on. And there starts to be the sound wave warfare, where um, the voice of Free Algeria is skipping from one frequency to another, and the, um, the, the French are trying to jam all of them. So Fanon writes that a new form of struggle had come into being. The listener, enrolled in the Battle of the Waves, had to figure out the tactics of the enemy, and in an almost physical way, circumvent the strategy of the adversary. So every night from 9 o'clock until midnight, Algerians would sit and listen to a radio program in which it was actually impossible to hear a single word. But what was audible was static um, and piercing, piercing screeches. And that announced, he writes, that the voice of the combatants was here. For an hour, the room would be filled with the piercing, excruciating din of the jamming. Behind each modulation, each act of crackling, the Algerian would imagine not only words but concrete battles. As a general rule, it is the voice of free Algeria that wins out. The enemy stations, once the broadcast is completed, abandon their work of sabotage. The military music of warring Algeria that concludes the broadcast can then freely fill the lungs and the heads of the faithful. These few brazen notes reward three hours of daily hope and have played a fundamental role for months in the training and strengthening of Algerian national consciousness. Now, we might, we might wonder if maybe this is, this is actually as much of an opera as the flight of the Lindberghs in some sense. You listen to Sanic for three hours, and then at the end of three hours, you hear a few notes of military music, and that's. Um, and so what we're getting here is a fundamentally different model of the public sphere and political participation than we get in Arendt or Habermas or certainly, for that matter, Brecht or Wagner. And of course, this is a um, this is a public that's created through armed conflict, right? And in calling this an opera, I might be uh, perpetrating the sort of the cardinal sin of aestheticizing politics, right? Um, but can it also, and can thinking about what um, radio radio operas do today through Fanon offer a model of the public that focuses on orality and that offers the possibility of a diasporic solidarity more generally? I think it's not just that Fanon can help us think about what these radio operas do, but that opera scholarship actually has a lot to say to help us understand um, what it means to create a public through voice. And certainly this is not the audience to rehearse that scholarship to, but I'll just say that there's a long tradition in this, right? It was when the Italian opera came to town that Rousseau wrote on the origin of languages, right, and decides that it's not just speech itself, but the sonority of voice that can create the very possibility of democratic life. Um, and of course, more recently, there's been a strong body of feminists and Lacanian approaches to opera studies that stresses this, this, the centrality of the voice. Does that voice need to be live? Is radio opera a way of thinking about what this voice might affect in the age of mechanical reproducibility, and now also through the website, new media. Um, so the question that I'll end with now is, uh, well, in addition to those two questions, is how important is it um, for opera, or how important is it for us that opera be live in order to be political? And what could politics mean without physical assembly? Thank you. Thank you. This is fantastic, and I feel like it resonates with different people in the morning and all sorts of ways, especially. And one thing I was wondering, thinking about what's at stake in calling these things opera, is if, if you're sort of embedding different things that are 
obsolete, but so opera is obsolete in the present. But radio is also is 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 obsolete, right? Like I mean, like it is a and like if you think of Benjamin and Brecht, that's because like that's that's the sort of moment of radio utopianism. So I'm wondering like what and like you know like so what's at stake in sort of having two sort of utopian projects that are sort of both obsolete embedded into one another and if and you know like what is how is that inflicting politics for example you, you know like this isn't like you could imagine some other form of sort of auditory politics that's just that's more purely digital like why do you need to look back mm -hmm. to radio at all mm -hmm. you know? yeah i think that's a really fascinating question and even the the sort of the url for the the commissioning website is, you know, document of 14 backslash public radio, not just radio, but public radio. Um, I mean, I think one thing about radio, and this I find really interesting in general, right, is that it's an obsolete form, but the very technology that made it obsolete now makes it retro and cool and very accessible, right? So um, maybe radio is out but podcasts are so in and i think i have a feeling people listen to more radio now than they did maybe 10 or 15 years ago um so this isn't a very this isn't a fully formed answer yet but i do think that there's something about the technology because it's outdated but also is able to work so well with new media that that's what yeah that that's what gives it it's kick now or well yeah yeah kind of my, my question is pretty directly related i was wondering you know what are like if i saw these art objects these works uh, mount in the u.s they i feel like they would not be called opera like that's not a word that u.s kind of experimental artists working in sound media necessarily mm -hmm. will default to and so i'm wondering if that and also the root funk, uh, the the indexing of radio and the title. I do you, like what do you make out of the uh, well, you already have this radio, but opera. And then I'm also wondering, are these just kind of ways of like indexing like Europeans high art subsidized? Like, is it is it a subsidized culture reference with in terms of um, yeah? yeah. Like why why did they use opera for these? I mean, I kind of feel like why why not use opera, right? That's that's an easy out. But I think that um, I mean, I think for post commodity, you're absolutely right that I that it is indexing something that this is not a group that I don't think they have any other works that they call operas, and mostly, I mean, a lot of what they do isn't even sound. Base necessarily, but I think there's certainly a a point in taking these, you know, Syrian folk songs or you know, indigenous music from the Southwest and saying this is opera and we're playing it on the site of the Lyceum, right? That's that's clearly a move in itself. I think as far as Winfunk Eterna, that that seems like just a straighter, he wanted to write an opera. Um, so, I, I to, to press a little bit, ask you to think a little bit about the, about the status of music in that, in the landscape mm -hmm. that you're describing, because it seems like there's a kind of authenticity that seems to be accruing to or ascribed to music, right? This is like the authentic voice of yeah. an authentic extant mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. That just seems, you know, I mean, if we juxtapose it to um, Joy's paper, right, it would seem as though contemporary composers seem to be going to some pains to assert the authenticity of a kind of fractured and fragmented voice, mm -hmm. whereas here we have a kind of invocation and circulation of a kind of authentic music making of the, of the, of the dispossessed funk. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm wondering about the, this, I mean, in answer to the question of why opera, like it seems like this, there seems to be a, 
and tell me if I got this wrong, but there seems to be the circulation of a really, I don't know, nostalgic or sense of, of, of what it would mean to be the bearer of, of music. And I mean, it seems like a quite imperial gesture, doesn't it? It's like, here, look, you know, I'll, I'll bring you the music of, of, of the people. And I wonder if there was any, whatever, thinking about or, or criticism or whatever of, 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 yeah. of that, of the status of music mm -hmm. or its politics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that was that was also a critique in general of a lot of the documental programming. I will say that Savvy Contemporary does have a longer track record of actually really doing a lot to bring um, to bring a more international scene to Berlin in terms of the art and in terms of the curation. So it is. I mean, the the sorts of commissions in terms of who was doing them were relatively diverse and also international. Um, I do think that a lot of the, in some ways when you delve into each individual thing, the politics did have exactly that sort of naivete that I think becomes troublesome of authenticity and, um, uh, and you know, the the voices coming out or all of that sort of, sort of thing. Um, and I think that's why I'm less interested actually in the music of it, um, which worked out well since I couldn't play it for you anyway. <laughs> but I think that's why I'm actually less interested in some ways in the content of each individual work than in the sort of the bigger form of creating this kind of public Recognizable content that could be 
and distribute it through various media formats, whether it's waves, links, or uh, I don't have my terminology wrong, but you know, or podcast format, digital, whichever format. Is it still radio then? Because we recognize the content. So I'm talking too long here, but the, the thing is really about like this kind of flipping and the playing with the flipping and whether or not that would be uh, fruitful for both of you. Yeah, I mean, I think, so one thing that's kind of interesting is if, uh, is it going to go back? If you look at the, uh, well, if you look at the actual schedule for post commodity, it's interesting because it's a full day long, right? But they break it down into five acts. Everything's time. There are things called the intermezzo and then there's also, but there are also elements that seem to actually be referring back to Greek tragedy of moments when there's sort of a comic interlude in the middle of something. Um, so yeah, I think certainly it's, and like you said, it, there, there are different ways, right? How, why is it important for a composer or an art collective to call something an opera or to insist that it's music theater or whatever? Um, instead of opera, and then what what does it do for us to use that terminology? Um, and you know, I don't know. I think to I think in both cases, I would say the same thing, which is just whatever what are whatever is useful um, for creating some kind of new way of either looking at the work or creating the work. Itself. I you can have those first, yeah. Did you? Well, I, I, yeah. Um, well, sort of, kind of coming to that and also um, responding to that and also what David was saying is just thinking that, you know, the other way of thinking about this idea of the voice as authenticity is just for, kind of flipping that around to the other side and thinking about the idea of the disembodied voice as being sort of more fundamentally about dislocation and migration and all these things that actually speak to those issues. I just feel like this is not the first set of pieces I've seen about the, you know, the contemporary refugee crisis that's about, um, that focuses on dislocated voices. And mm -hmm. part of the, it's a, a, two things about that. One is just, you know, maybe there are kind of other notions of the public sphere that would fit that better. Things like Hardin Negri or something like that that could speak to that kind of issue of sort of flows as a part as it and, and the dislocated voice could be that. The, the other thing though is that I was just thinking as you were as you were talking that the, the the term opera actually does some work there, right? Precisely by underlining the fact of disembodiment. It says there should be a body here singing or something. Um, and instead we have radio. So it's only through the addition of opera to radio or mm -hmm. something like that that you have that yeah, kind of tension really being introduced yeah. here. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Also, I mean, I think I kind of I think Hart and Agri are are also into assembly, right? Like I think, but um, but I do. I mean, I think it's fascinating what you say about opera needing needing to be there. But um, uh, oh, sorry, I just forgot what I was. Wait to say to that, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> um, if I could respond to his point and then to sort of move on, I mean, it, it, in a way it seems to me, based on the conversation so far today, that there's sort of two different basic definitions of opera that are in play. I mean, one of them seems to be some sort of vague mm -hmm. Wagnerian, because I'm concerned about it, that like, that anything that's combining different arts is this sort of an opera, and that's what the Robert Wilson is sort of an opera, and that's what this is sort of it. like. It just seems like it's something an artist can, it's like a term an artist could use to describe something that's bringing various things together. But I mean, I, I mean, also, I mean, in in Troy's paper, it seems like it, it, it is something very different, and it's the sort of sort of I mean, that, that, that there are sort of historical references that it recognizes as. You know, as, as conventions in a sort of good way. I mean, and I feel like so. so I mean, I, I think it's probably worth thinking about those separately in one reason or the other. But I mean, I also, I mean, just thinking back to the to David's thing, it seems like one of the things that's interesting about the Wilson is it's that those two definitions sort of cave in on each other. Like you 
think you're getting, you know, Gazankas trick that brings all arts and all people together in some sort of transcendental unity, and then at the climax at the end, like, all you actually get is, like, Luke Fovatore written by Philip Glass, right? <laughs> so, 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 so that it's like, it's sort of like, it's like, it's sort of this one definition of opera sort of fall, fades into the other one or something. So that, but I mean, it did, I mean, I feel like those, we could do more to think about, which, you know, that those seem like the two models that have been in play so far. Um, David and Joy, that we really should move on, but like, yeah. Well, I was just going to, you know, just to respond quickly, the reason I use opera is because that's what she calls it. She very, and so I, um, that's a, it sounds like a cop-out, but it's not. I mean, I feel like if that's the, what she wants to call it, there are plenty of works we call operas that the creators don't call operas, and I feel like that's a frame for our interpretation. So, but that's why I defaulted to that. I have, you know, there are plenty of other pieces that really the artist doesn't call it an opera, so I feel like when the, and that degree of intentionality, I feel like genre designation is something to, to pay attention to. Um, but it's, I think that also brings up this interesting tension where the intentionality flies in the face of all the conventions that accrue to the word, what does that mean? So, yeah, thank you. I, I think along very similar lines, it seems to me that opera in this case can be used as a kind of, you know, form of class critique or even denunciation, right? That is, if I'm doing what I understand to be culturally and politically oppositional work, and I say I'm doing an opera, it seems to me my work is addressed then necessarily to what I think can be reasonably described as a ruling class. Mm -hmm. And so, like, all of a sudden or immediately, the genre is less about, you know, generic purity than it is, I think, about address. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I'm doing a radio opera, like, I wonder whether it's less about, you know, the sounds I'm generating than the recipients I'm anticipating. And that's a political act. The, yeah, the address thing is key, and that, that does make me remember what I was going to say as well, because I, um, I, I, I like that you use dislocated, because I think these voices aren't, they aren't disembodied, right? Mm -hmm. In the gramophone effect, had you been able to really hear it, you would hear there's this, um, you know, a super kind of racist and imperialist account of this British guy going around and collecting sound recordings in India, but it's being read by an Indian woman, right? And there, you know, you could, there's a body behind that voice that that fundamentally changes how you listen to what's being said, right? And that that also changes what you, how you as an addressee feel, and maybe complicate some of the the more. Um, naive or the, oh, this is their authentic voices um, reception, that this, that doing something like that does something else, casting, non-traditional casting, if you will, of these documentary works. So I hate to cut this discussion off, however, the next paper is called Opera Beyond Itself Installing the Opera, <laughs> so we'll hopefully um, keep things going. It will be delivered by Yelena Novak, who works as a researcher, dramaturg, and critic. She, Yelena focuses on tendencies in recent opera and music theater, contemporary music more broadly, multiplicities in musical analysis, and voice studies. She's currently working on a book project called Opera in the Expanded Field, and is also preparing um, what's going to be an indispensable co-edited volume on Einstein on the Beach. So, Great. welcome, Yelena. Thank you. I'm very grateful and excited to be at this conference, and I'm very glad that this, uh, that the scholarship about contemporary opera is definitely moving forward. <laughs> so I hope that we will have more conferences like this in the future. Uh, and one thing to, to mention before I start is that uh, this paper partly is a product of the research that I've done together, more or less together, with the curator Chris Dito, who is based in Rotterdam. And actually with her I'm preparing an exhibition next year, in 2019, in May, uh, where the working title of the exhibition is Post Opera. And there we should place all kinds of pieces, uh, installation and visual arts that take opera as their subject and or material. 
So thank you, Chris, although you're, you're here. Um, yes, some of the questions that will float after my presentation are also uh, in relation to what is opera and what is operatic. So in the last decade or so, visual artists happen to be more and more interested in opera, making it subject and material for their installations. There is also the movement in contrary direction. Some existing operas were staged in a way that more resembled installation than the opera work. I should mention just a few pieces to give some kind of context. Of course, there are much more of this, but just to make some kind of frame. So, Claudia Monitor, the British composer, for example, that made desk opera Remember Me, taking an old desk, which this was the only thing she inherited from her grandmother, and then she installed uh, with her music some little opera on that desk. Uh, then, the piece that I will talk about in more detail, Operas for a Small Room by Jenny Cardiff and George Barnes Miller. Also the piece by Marguerite Dumont, the installation, the opera of prehistoric creatures from 2012. Also we'll discuss it in more details. Then reality opera by Dutch composer Jakob Terve, Jakob Terve Welthaus. Uh, the news that exists in vi various editions, it calls them, uh, and is performed as an opera on the stage with the, uh, with the musicians and the singers. But somehow it resembles more to the, some kind of video installation with music. Then uh, a cyclus of five one-minute operas, also by Dutch composer and director Michel Mandera. One of them is Flight MH370, Malaysia Airline, where the singer is, is kind of discussing with the video of the other singer that is there, and all his operas basically deal with this discussion between the video and the illusion between the video and what is performed live. Another one with the Dutch queen, uh, ex-queen Beatrix, God Home and the Oranje from 2012. And finally, video installation by Katarina Zdjeller, uh, artist based in Rotterdam, also Ah My Heart, uh, that deals with various kinds of voices, uh, that are superimposed to one body that is producing them. And then other pieces, like the operas, that were staged as kind of installation. The one that I just saw in Amsterdam is Medusa Raft uh, by Hans Werner Henze, originally an oratorio, by staged by Roma Castellucci and made into a kind of opera. But that staging actually functioned more as some kind of video installation again with the uh, live performance. And finally, Einstein on the Beach as opera installation by Bertolt Schneider and Veronika Witte uh, from 2001 in Berlin and 2005 also in Berlin. So this will be the lecture map. So I picked up Einstein on the Beach. Uh, why I picked it up? Because I think it's a very important reading of this opera and uh, unfortunately it's not no, it's almost not known. And I think that these two authors really retaught the whole concept of Einstein and Beach through it. And then the second group of pieces uh, where installation takes opera into it, it's opera for a small room and the opera of prehistoric creatures. I picked them up um, for this occasion because they directly refer to, to the opera in their title and directly refer to some kind of tradition of the opera. So, Einstein on the Beach by Philip Glass and Robert Wilson brought into sharp focus the enhanced status of the opera director, who becomes in effect the co-creator of the piece. Over, over a long performance history spanning more than 40 years, Einstein has been staged by artists other than Wilson on only four occasions. Bertolt Schneider and Veronika Witte presented Einstein as an opera installation that crossed over to the field of visual arts to a very large extent. The installation took place in the former building of the Staatsbank of the GDR in Berlin in 2001. Schneider and Witte repeated the performance in 2005 using the same concept but in a different space since the Staatsbank had by then been transformed into a luxurious hotel. <laughs> 
The new space that accommodated the piece was the building of the Parochial Kirche in Berlin. Snyder and Vita included the original musical score, but excluded any trace of Wilson's staging, Lucinda Child's choreography, or Christopher Knowles and Child's texts. The only spoken text that remained was the one by Samuel M. Johnson, two lovers from the last new play. With Veronica Vita responsible for the space concept presentation, Ari Benjamin Meyers as musical director, and Tino Segal as choreographer, in 2001, Snyder had a team ready to share the adventure of restaging Einstein as a complex installation on different floors in a huge historical building. By inviting visual artists and scientists to create the work within the performance space, Snyder and Vita inhabited Einstein with various artworks pertaining mostly to the extended field of visual art. Most of the installations were interactive, so members of the audience were invited to participate. The installation in Staatsbank Berlin functioned in this way. A day would start with the opening of the Staatsbank Berlin spaces to the audience. The installations by various artists were permanently there, so the space already functioned as a kind of exhibition space. Then at some point that was not previously announced, the Einstein music would start, quote, we used the lounge aspect of the music by actually putting the lounge there. The music was really soft, people were, ch were chatting. It was like you were going to the club and the music is Philip Glass. The music was audible whenever you were, the end of quote, for Bertolt Schneider. For the first, first three hours of the performance, it did not matter to the spectator which of the Stadtbank Berlin rooms he or she was in. The music of Einstein was performed as in the score with no interventions. The music ensemble was situated in the main room and singers were performing in the whole building. A visual transcription of the opera score visualized on 15 monitors allowed Snyder to direct the singers in the whole building and the singers to follow the conductor everywhere. The sound of the performance was transmitted in real time with loudspeakers carrying it to dozens of different rooms, corridors, and staircases where the artist installations were placed. The spectators could walk freely between performance spaces. This obviously makes reference to the original production by Wilson Glass, where audience members were allowed to enter or exit the space as they choose. Some of the singers were video recorded while, while singing, with their image transmitted in real time to screens in other performance rooms, effectively creating video, further video installations. After three hours, somewhere before the spaceship scene, the performance itself became more theatrical, so it was more important for spectators to gather in the vicinity of the performance. The exhibition at that point would be closed, and all the members of the audience would be invited to the main room, where, quote, something would happen that was clearly performative by Bertolt Schneider. This gathering of the audience for a performative event was also a feature of the second version of this staging in Parochial Kirche in Berlin in 2005. The concept remained the same, but the result was quite different since the two venues were completely unlike one another, and a different set of artists and scientists had been invited to create the work. At the point when the audience was supposed to gather in one space, the huge inflatable partitions that previously divided the church were deflated so that the whole church became a single space. We are going to see a kind of trailer for it. Thank you. 
The survival fantasy of 60s and 70s that informed Snyder and Vita's vision of Einstein. They wanted to show that this fantasy was no longer valid. Their staging emphasized the science had shifted its focus from space to the cells of the human body, to DNA. What they did in re redirecting the gaze to the human body and shifting the focus from public to private, from, micro to, from macro to microcosmos, was to put together a questionnaire that members of the audience were supposed to complete. Audience members, as well as some of the performers, entered the kind of boot where they responded in writing to questions about their own identity. They would be requested, for example, to choose the three parts of their body that they liked the most, and then a new kind of <laughs> organism would be suggested inspired by those body parts. <laughs> and exactly at that point, a different kind of emotional climax was supposed to occur. Snyder talked about the urge that exists in Einstein to say something very emotional. And quote, this urge we intensified as Bob Wilson did himself. It was overwhelming in a Wagnerian sense. Yeah. Another example comes from the artists whose work most often merges music and theater elements and exhibits them in the context and within protocols of visual art. Artists Janet Cardiff and George Burris Miller, a pair that works together, created already several installations that rework opera and operatic. In many of their works, Cardiff and Miller show interest in transposing the listening spectator in different kind of reality, whether that would be an imaginary dentist room, like a machine, cottage and golf in a storm, like in a storeroom, cinema auditorium, or the opera house. Manipulating the sense of reality is what Miller underlines in a recent interview as their central interest. They enjoy creating the illusion and the fact that the spectator knows that he or she is in the illusion, but that it still affects him or her, plays a very important role for them. The projected sound that they often use is the one called a binaural sound, a sound that is usually recorded in a special way, but putting the tiny microphones in mannequins head ears, or in the human ears, that, that way providing the realistic effect of three-dimensionality of the sound space that enables listening spectator wearing headphones to hear it as it is coming from various directions like in real life. Opera, uh, opera for a small room takes a central position in their opus. However, there are two works by these artists that precede opera in a small room and that show development of the similar idea through almost one decade. First one is the installation Playhouse. Cardiff Miller described it as a mixed media with video projection in binaural audio where the viewer listener sits wearing a headset by themselves in a lounge overlooking a miniature architectural model of an opera house. The binaural soundtrack mixes with a video projection of an opera singer to combine mystery, drama, and suspense. The inside part of the installation contains several theater-like chairs and the miniature doll-like doll house opera stage on which the projection of the opera singer happens. Authors engulf the listening spectator into a narrative, seduce him or her with a 3D projection of the sound to the point that they hear when the someone is late to the performance, passes them and whispers to them. The visitors of the gallery unexpectedly find themselves in a position of the opera goers. This idea of transposing into the realm of different art evolves into different direction, but in a similar, similar manner in a paradise institute. There, the gallery visitor becomes cinema goer, and since this concept grew through different pieces, few years after Paradise Institute opera for a small room was conceived. Cardiff and Miller describe it like this. There are 24 antique loudspeakers out of which come songs, sound, areas, arias, and occasional pop tunes. There are almost 2,000 records stacked around the room and eight record players, which turn on and off robotically syncing with the soundtrack. The sound of someone moving and sorting albums is heard. The audience cannot enter the room to see and hear his world. They have to look through windows, holes in the walls, and cracks in the doorways and watch his shadow move around the room. Yeah. Different 
to the Playhouse at Paradise Institute, here the listening spectator cannot enter the installation. Also, the sound is not coming through the headphones like in two previous works. A wooden cottage is installed, detached from the rest of the gallery atmosphere, and inside of it a different world is created, a world related to opera. The installation starts with the sounds of tuning orchestra. The turntables are programmed to play different records and most often excerpts from different historical operas are heard. It appears that the artist brought the LPs in the record shop in Canada and that all these records belong to the person whose name was Royal Benehi, if we believe the artist. <laughs> Ulrike Hartung quotes the artists explaining their relation to the opera and that character in this piece. Quote, what interests us is this extreme cultural juxtaposition between the opera and the small western town in which Royal then he lived. What was he thinking of while listening to these records recorded in foreign cities at the other end of the world? Did he have a training as a singer? Did he want to make a career as an opera singer? Had he lost a lover and found consolations in the music? Did he dream one day traveling to these distant opera houses? We imagine that he would sing while listening and thus create his own opera, detached from space and time dimensions. The end quote. Hartung underlines that everything in the cottage looks old and worn out. The same could be said for the melancholic man's voice that leads the listening spectator through the piece. That even maybe is the fictitious character of Denneke himself. At the, beginning of the, uh, at the beginning, the lights get dimmed and the narrator tries out if his voice is heard well over the speakers. He begins to narrate and first describes the scenario in front of which he finds himself. Later, we hear historical recordings of Una Furtima Lagrima from Gaetano Donizetti's Elisir de More, sung by Enrico Caruso. The narrative evolves surrounded and accompanied by fragments of opera arias, La Mama Morta from Umberto Giordano's Andrea Chenier is heard. Towards the end, Percy's Sledge, when a man loves a woman, is also heard and slowly this operatic drama disintegrates towards the end. Experiments in opera, Michael Early describes this piece as an uncomfortable and transient experience that says this is a history that has ended and indeed become dated through the renaissance of better technology. 
And this is important point where he, the edges of one world can be perceived, the world where opera ends and operatic begins. But before defining the operatic, I go to another example of operatic installation that comes from the visual art, the opera of prehistoric creatures by artist and designer Margarita Moore. The most fascination with the relationship between the voice and the body stands behind this piece. In a synthetic biology class at London Royal College of Art, 24-year-old Margarita Mo learned about the work of Japanese researcher Hideyuki Sawada, dismembered mouth singing a Japanese lullaby. That mouth has been called the most mechanically accurate talking robot, with real moving lips, a windpipe that flexes and expands, and even lungs, a pressurized air tank. Mo was inspired to do the same thing, but with animals. She said she realized there was no area of science that specialized in extinct sound, and there she found her inspiration. I'm interested in pushing the limit of existing systems of knowledge and confronting the experts that I'm working with to their own gaps in knowledge to see what happens when science stops and speculation starts, she says. I think that is where you find poetry. Since then, Humo has completed several works of extinct sound, the first of which is Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, one of the earliest known hominids. To recreate Lucy's voice, Humo studied available skeletal data from Lucy's remains. She constructed synthetic versions of the resonance cavities of Lucy's skull. After more meetings with paleontologists and other specialists, Humo reconstructed Lucy's voice box out of silicone and rubber. The result is haunting the old. For more than a year, Margarito Mo has been discussing with paleontologists, zoologists, veterinarians, engineers, explorers, surgeons, ear and throat specialists, and radiologists. She reconstructed the sound of prehistoric creatures by reconstructing their vocal tract. This is problematic from the scientific point of view, since the vocal tract is made of soft tissue, it does not fossilize. The only things that have been preserved through time are the surrounding bones. The inner parts had to be redesigned. The opera is performed by four creatures, vocal tracts, and their synthetic vibrating vocal cords, a mammoth imperator, an entelodont aka terminator pig, an australopithecus afarensis aka lucy, and ambulocetus aka walking whale. Concerning vocalization of recreated creatures, they are produced by the air that is pumped into their vocal mechanisms. It is the sound, constructed and organized sound, and the process of its construction determines the whole piece. Now just maybe a minute from a kind of trailer of this piece, but unfortunately the creatures are not seen in the gallery. It's just some kind of video montage. just to hear how they sound. got an impression. Their function is similarly like 
in conventional warfare to narrate the story. In this case, this is fluent and ambivalent story of creatures living long ago. The function of sound in this installation is to make a reference, to propose a story to the spectator, and even more, to physically intervene into the perception of one who looks and listens and promote the curiosity, but may also the fear. The fear of those unarticulated creatures and their bodies, owners of those voices. With the questioning of the body voice relationship, this piece stands on the line with one of the most peculiar problematics in contemporary opera, the way how the body voice relationship in post opera and its reinvention, like technology or desynchronization or gender confusion, makes contemporary opera go beyond its borders. And finally, why this exchange between the art of opera and visual arts, especially installation, happens? It is clear for me that institutionally, very often, contemporary opera is completely different from conventional opera. And I tend to think very often about contemporary opera and to compare it in some kind of institutional ways to the world of contemporary dance. Uh, like the world of dance refers to or not refer to, to, to the world of classical ballet and the relationship is similar like conventional opera and contemporary opera. Uh, to that point that even at some point I think the contemporary dance took the primacy from contemporary theatre at some point at least at Europe. And these are, there I find similarities and as you probably all of you know when uh, someone is doing research in contemporary opera it's a completely different kind of research than when you research the conventional opera. When you research in the conventional opera, most of the times you know where to go. There are opera houses, there is con and where is con uh, contemporary opera, you need to find the artist, they need to send you the videos or the recordings, or it happened in the abandoned swimming pool and no one made the, the, the archive work, etc. etc. Et so contemporary opera mostly, although it sometimes happens in the in the, in the opera houses, but mostly it's not institutionalized, I think, still, in a way. So, uh, why opera goes to the visual arts, it occurred to me with this opera in a small room, that maybe, for some kind of reason, opera goes to visual arts to find some kind of new institution, in a way. Symbolically, this little cottage in a gallery space is maybe some new kind of, of the opera house that these kind of contemporary opera experiments are, are looking for. And the contrary direction, why visual arts are searching for the opera, uh, there I came to the term of operatic that I think most of us use, but when you ask someone what operatic is, I think most of us will not know exactly how to respond or how to define it. Or the, actually it's, it's one term that is quite hard to define. Here I kind of quote the Marcia Citron that talks about this term or the term operaticness. And she says that it can suggest that the essential qualities of opera are emphasized, especially artifice, exaggeration, and emotion. And of course, it is very fluent definition, but for me, it's the most intriguing aspect of this definition is this artifice. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that this artifice comes from the relationship of the singing body and the voice, that in opera strongly denies any attempt of realism as artistic language. Something artificial is not natural, but in this case is also not realistic. And I think maybe this artifice, and on the other hand, some myth from the, that exists also in the visual arts for the Gesamtkunstwerk, Maybe these two points are the most essential points of the, the operatic that visual arts are looking for from the opera. Uh, so to try to define operatic, I just wrote that operatic designates all those practices, languages, interventions in which specific body voice gap typical for conventional opera is reproduced, reworked or reinvented. And I would like maybe to finish with this. I prepared also another example, but I doubt we have time. Maybe better than in front of the discussion. Uh, but I forgot to 
picture actually because it's it's on Vimeo. Maybe at the end or something. Yeah, yeah, like that. yeah. Maybe we can do because it needs some password. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. No, that's not good. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> On, on the question of the offer of it, uh, I'm trying to think how to, how to phrase this exactly. Well, actually, first I want to say, I saw that Janet Cardiff uh, offer piece in 2005. I completely forgot about it, so thank you for all of a sudden I remember my experience of it. And for what it's worth, what I recall especially is this incredible feeling of voyeurism, because you're peering through this like little crack mm -hmm. in the wall, and, and you're watching, or mostly listening to some strange, like, dusty, almost like erotic fantasy of some man or something. It's very, very odd. So that all came back to me. Can't believe I forgot about it. Um, the point is well taken that, that operatic is hard to kind of define, and it does definitely seem to be a kind of interest well beyond the field of people who are studying opera. But then I was thinking, like, of all the artists who are in various ways turning to opera, I wonder whether even calling the work operatic is right in that frequently they're dealing, you know, quite literally with operas. Like, is it worth using the adjectival form when they're actually, like, using operas? Like, if they wanted to be operatic, they could be using all sorts of exaggerated or artificial things. Why are they actually interested in opera as such? I mean, I guess opera as such is the epitome of operaticness, I guess, but it also is opera. And that seems to me somehow weirdly different. And I guess what I was thinking is that there's an entire it's not, it's not just these kinds of affects and experiences and aesthetics we're talking about. There's a culture around opera, and it means something that it gets preserved uh, and in either honored or critiqued or whatever in these installation works. Uh, so anyway, that's just a thought, and I'm wondering what, what, what you think about that. And I guess it's also striking that in a funny way, when I was thinking about you know, inviting people to this conference, I was realizing that a lot of the visual, I guess, visual affiliated artists that I was thinking of actually are much more involved with the tradition of opera than the various composers who have seemed like experimental, you know, composers to me. So in a funny way, it's in visual art that the legacy of opera lives on in a much, I don't know, more conservative sense. So anyway, yeah, it's just kind of a bunch of thoughts, but I don't know if you have an idea about that. Why opera rather than operaticness for these people? Well, as I said, I picked these two examples because they really refer to the opera, but there are many more, and the one that I should find somewhere <laughs> is the one that does not mention opera at all, uh, but still refers to some gesture of the opera in, in some way. Why it's interesting for visual artists, I think on one side, and I'm more and more sure in that, that it's a kind of mode at the moment. It's a, it's a kind of uh, fashionable at the moment. But on the other hand, I think it's this experience of Gesamtkunstwerk that they, they need some grandeurs, they like to combine all kinds of things, all kinds of arts in, in one, and somehow they, they find opera as a satisfactory product to, to import to their pieces. Recently, for example, Rana Hamade in Rotterdam made a series of pieces that culminated with the performance of her opera that was made by her. But uh, that, that opera was not at all interesting in a way, but what was interesting, it was a, a, a series of pieces that she made using all these materials on the process of the work, and she made all kinds of installations in the gallery of them. So it's definitely somehow at the moment in the air, various people in, in various countries countries are using it, and I'm still trying to, to discover why exactly, <laughs> but um, I'm not sure. I'm glad to hear that the work wasn't interesting. Yeah. We were thinking about inviting her, and I didn't have like, enough money to bring that many people from other countries, so at least we didn't make a mistake. Well, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion, yeah. Uh, just a comment about the, the work, I don't I, I know it before, so I don't remember the name, with the, with the record players and... Uh, I was thinking that it, it also might refer to, to Europa as well. Yeah. 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 I, I remember which of the cages Europa has um, sort of these 
remember these record players where they, they have sort of scenes, I think it's scenes of operas and then the singers come in. And what's, what's interesting is that that was commissioned as sort of, let, let's compose the last possible opera. Let's sort of, this will be the final, finally, let it, let it die already, you know, whatever. And to die, but finally, and then Cage has his, yeah, his record players. With, so yeah, it's just taken right this and kind of connected, but uh, strange it's sure right. is, yeah, it's interesting. Well, yeah, you know, it's, we're dealing with kind of like what is opera culture, so I guess, you know, what is naturally going to go. Um, I mean, it's like, to, to, to be more maybe cynical about it, I mean, it seems like what, what we're defining as opera is if someone calls it an opera or if someone in this room calls it an opera, even though the artist didn't call it an opera, we can like bring it into the conversation. So I'm wondering, I mean, it doesn't seem like have you, asked, have you asked anyone why they call it an opera? Because I, I, they, to call something an opera, you get something out of that. I think part of it is that maybe you get, if you're very invested in the tradition, you get some participation in that tradition. If you're not invested in that tradition, you get some kind of radical critique. Mm -hmm. Or in both cases, you get some kind of cultural capital and possibly access to certain networks like funding, patronage, and reception that not call it something like that. Like, so for example, the Prototype Festival that happens in New York, which is kind of sponsored by Bethlehem and Projects, they do all kinds of experimental music theater, but they call themselves an opera music theater festival. And I've gotten an email from their PR person who says, please note that this is an opera music theater festival. We feel this word opera is important. And what do they feel is important about it? Part of it is that they'll get reviews from classical music critics, regardless of the crazy things they do. And there are probably like maybe 200 experimental theater festivals happening in New York at any given moment. But if you call it an opera one, you unlock all kinds of, and also you unlock our conversation about it. So I'm wondering, what what do you think these people get out of calling it an opera in the kind of context in which they're working? Uh, I think they call it an opera for a small room, but I, I don't think that they think it is an opera. I think it's just kind of using it in the title and because they work a lot with music and the theater aspects, they, they just import it as it could be seen through this development of this idea. They needed some isolated experience, very specific experience, and they found it in an opera. And this earlier piece, I think it, it serves as a kind of draft for what it became later. So they had it obviously in mind for a long time, and uh, probably when they got more money, to, because this installation also is very expensive, transport and to, to make all kinds of insurances and all these kinds of things. What they get from calling it an opera, they get some kind of glamour also, I think, that opera, whether we would like that or not, and it does not happen <coughs> that often in contemporary opera, but opera is still kind of, belongs to some kind of elitist. So, I, think it's... I was just you know, this makes me think of Eric Durat's piece on the ends of genre, and it's not about the categories; it's about the act of grouping things. And so, if we group of people decide to group things together in a genre category, that is more significant than the category itself. So, I mean, Hamilton is a good opportunity, but yeah. we don't need to be Hamilton doesn't need to be called an opera because it gets everything. It's it's like it's not the tier above opera. It does not need opera. Right. Well, what is the so, just, just occurred to me. One interesting thing is in the world of contemporary opera, mostly, if you're not Philip Glass, probably, but mostly operas are performed once mm -hmm. and then maybe repeated once or twice, and that's the lifespan. With putting an opera into a gallery, opera or something operatic into a gallery, I think the possibilities, the institutional possibilities are much, much mm -hmm. larger. Some longer lives. So, and it will have a longer life and much more possibilities to travel and yeah. maybe also this is one of the aspects. Although, I mean, without agreeing with this, this sort of account of things, it also seems to me that, I mean, these these contemporary artists that are using opera that you've shown, and I mean other ones I can think of, it seems that they keep coming back to a set of things. Like for these visual artists, opera always seems to be associated with, you know, early 20th century technologies, which goes back to Minu. I mean, it, and it seems to be associated with, with dinosaurs and with lost <laughs> voices and with, and I mean, and so I mean, so it seems to me that it, for, and I think this is not how contemporary 
what contemporary composers are thinking about when they're dealing with that. But, but it seems like contemporary visual artists that use opera seem to keep being interested in the same things mm -hmm. about, you, you know, like it's like they think, think of it in this, in this, it, like it seems to carry a set of associations with it that I think are about sort of, sort of obsolescence and loss and things. So, so I mean, I think it's, I mean, the, there's a question of, of, of prestige and funding, but I, th I mean, I feel like what they then find interesting about opera is makes that a bit more complicated at the same time. Um, but I think that's really different from what's at stake for you know any number of sort of music scenes mm -hmm. using that as a term. Um, there's we're over schedule. Does anyone have a is there a final question anyone wants to ask? Um, if not, th thank you both. And so we will reconvene in 25 minutes. For thank you.